record. All right, hello everybody, this is Rachel Jensen here, and today we have a very special guest with us. This is a pretty new concept for us where we invite our very busy CEO, Mike Cobb, onto the presentation with us to give us a little bit more insight about the projects that he's working on. Mike Cobb has been working in the region for over two decades at this point. He really does have an incredible eye for scouting out opportunities and finding projects that will do quite well in the marketplace. So with that, that, Mike, I'm going to ask you a question here because this is this is something that I know that I've been one. I wondered at first when I first joined the organization is you found this great piece of property on Amber Gris Key. Mm -hmm. Usually, when developers are coming into regions, especially beach regions, they're going for that prime beachfront location. They want to build the most beautiful, the sexiest property out there. Grand Bayman is a little bit different. While it's very nicely built, it is a little bit off the the primary road, and what attracted you to this property and what got you interested in it? Yeah, great great question, and, and I wanna thank all the folks that are joining us. In fact, I still see some folks coming in, so it's great that, uh, that we've got a great, yeah, great great group of folks, and hi, Della down in Florida. Thanks for joining us tonight. <laughs> I always do a couple you know, shout outs when I can see a name I know. Um, you know, Rachel, the, the, the reality is, is that Yes, most developers come in, they, they buy a beachfront property, they build very, very expensive, beautiful uh, uh, product that, that, you know, in many cases can show up on the cover of, you know, travel magazines or the architectural digest. I mean, they're just spectacular properties and there is a market for that. But what a lot of developers really fail to realize is that there are far more customers who can afford a $150,000, $250,000 dollars product than there are who can afford a half a million, three quarter a million dollar property. And so, you know, what we have always done from the very beginning is we've looked for properties that are very, very close to the amenity. And in this case, we're two blocks off the ocean. But there's a tennis court, there's a giant swimming pool, there's a club facility with a workout and yoga, and they do water aerobics and all kinds of things like that. And so for us, to be able to be two blocks off the water, the cost of the real estate is significantly less. And what that translates to is a price point that's much more affordable for many, many more people who can access this incredible quality of life or vacation experience. And, and we, we have a lot of both. Much of the product that we build and deliver to the marketplace is geared for a residence. It's geared for somebody who's gonna live there several months out of the year. Maybe they're a snowbird out of Canada, or in many cases, full time. They literally move lock, stock and barrel to one of our communities and, and live there. And so, uh, and, and what's interesting is now in this post COVID, pre middle of COVID, but kind of this post COVID awareness, let me say that, th there are a lot of people who now have been working from home for three, four, five months and they know they can do it. And their bosses know that they're just as productive working from home as they are working in the office. And so, this site, and I've seen some articles very recently, and I've written a few myself, uh, I've, I've been tracking this hard because what this really means is if you can work from your home in Florida, Pittsburgh, Calgary, Toronto, you can work from anywhere. And so this idea of I'm going to wait till I'm 65 to retire and then I'm going to move where I really want to be has really kind of turned on its head because now if you're in your 40s or 50s, your kids, let's say your kids are out, right? I mean, if, if you have kids in school, it, it, it's a different dynamic, right? But if your kids have left home and you're in your 50s, say, and you think, well, I was going to wait another 10, 15 years to retire, but why? I can move to this wonderful place. I love to scuba dive for Belize, for example. We're going to talk about Belize tonight. I love to scuba dive. I love to fly fish. I love the weather. I love the Caribbean. I just want to get there now keep doing my day job during the day. And, and on the weekends, you know, I don't have to fly anywhere to go diving. I can literally take my stuff, walk two, two blocks to the dock, get on a boat, and in 15 minutes be diving in some of the best diving in the world, right? So what, what we're really seeing is this new awareness in the marketplace for people who say, I don't have to wait anymore. I can actually make move up my retirement because I'm not really going to retire, but I can move up that element of this retirement dream that I've always had and bring it into my life much, much sooner. So it's very exciting. We're, we're watching it. We're tracking it. And I know that with the, uh, the, the fleet and the tiny home properties that, that you have there in, in uh, Belize and in in Key, Key, uh, both of those products sold out post COVID. I think it's what, four, like almost 40 units, 20, 20 plus what, 
16 or something, right? 30. Wow, so 32. 32. 32 units sold since March. Um, and so I, I think the transaction uh, speaks volumes, right? It, it, it does. I mean, look, a lot of times people think about what they're going to do. They're talking about their survey. They might, they could, they would, blah, 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 right? But when they get out their checkbook and actually transact, that's real. And to have 32 folks transact in, in the last 90 days uh, really speaks volume about what people are thinking and this change of thinking as well. It, it's powerful. And, and we're just at the cusp of it. And, and I think coming back to your question, why did we build off the water, right? Why did we, why did we build a product that's in this case, a hundred and, you know, just hundred grand or right around a hundred, 115,000 or whatever it is with the furniture and the taxes, right? Because it fits a price point that many, 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 many people can afford. And then when you throw in financing, it makes it even more affordable. Um, it, that's why Rachel, because there's a segment of the population that wants this and in many cases needs it because of the, 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 the lifestyle that they want to have. They can afford it in a country like Belize, right? Whereas in the U.S., if you move to Florida, I mean, it depends on where you are, but, but it can be very, very expensive. If you're, I know Dallas down there on the, on the west coast of Florida, I mean, it can be very, very expensive. But you can move to similar weather, similar climate for a cost of living that's, that's half. So I think the need is there as well as the want, desire. And this market uh, really is important to serve. And we are truly one of the few developers in the region serving this market uh, as well as, as we do. Uh, it, it's really, it's, it's actually, it's, it's a wonderful thing. I mean, it, it comes from a heart of service. Uh, to answer your question a little differently, it comes from the heart of service because there's a need, there's a desire, and there's a lack of people providing this to the marketplace. And that's what we can do. We can serve these folks with a product they want and can afford. And then they can find this lifestyle that they've always dreamed about and wanted. And now again, with this, this COVID shift, I think a lot of people are going to be obtaining it much sooner in the process, which is, which is wonderful for everybody. It's, it's true. And that's exactly what we're seeing as people looking for plan Bs and looking for other options outside of their home country. And what I realized that I forgot to do in the beginning here was let people know that this really is their call. We're doing this Q&A yeah. session for you with Mike, because I know many of you have had the chance before to talk to our property consultants, talking with me, talk with whomever on the team, but you, necess you haven't necessarily had the chance to meet Mike in, in person or over the screen here. And before COVID, Mike and I would go to a lot of conferences. We'd have the opportunity to meet people face to face. And so it's a little bit different now. We're adjusting with the time. So we wanted to be able to give you a similar sort of opportunity to get us on the phone here, get us on the screen and answer the questions for you. So what I did not do a good job doing was letting you know that while you were practicing with the Q&A section of Zoom, that's where it is you're going to be typing in any questions that perhaps you've been wondering about the Grand Maven property, about us as UCI development. If you wanted to do a little bit more due diligence on us, the questions that may be on your mind, I know, Mike, you mentioned uh, the fleet building, and, and what I'll do is I'll, I'll keep talking as these questions come in because there are a lot of questions I know I've had from my clients who um, I see some of them here on the screen, but many others who were either not able to make it or maybe haven't asked this question yet and aren't thinking it. Um, you talked a lot about in your previous answer about serving clients who are looking to relocate and retire in another location, and we have definitely seen that during this COVID time that people are looking for their plan B. They're looking for alternative options. The number of conversations I've had, our property consultants have had with people who are just scared of what's going on and want a plan B. And we're seeing that as a result of the sales. But what we're also seeing is people who are maybe not necessarily ready to make that sort of decision yet. They're looking for a property in between that can be put perhaps in the investment, in the investment market. And um, I think many of you on this line know that we've recently branded Grand Bayman as a Best Western. So that is substantial for the, those folks who are thinking investment perspective. Can you talk to us a little bit more about why it is that you decided to partner with Best Western and what you hope to get out of the relationship with them? And what yeah, you sure. hope our, our owners get out of the relationship with them as well? Yeah, absolutely. You know, a couple of things. Let me come at that question in a couple of different directions. Sure. One, just in, in maybe the most simple and most basic form, when you, when you partner with a brand, what you get are, you get several things, but, but what you get are a set of processes, procedures, and standards 
that that's what the brand really delivers in a substantive way to the property. Mm -hmm. And that's, that, that's foundational, right? Because I think it's, you know, Hey, look, I mean, if, you know, if, if people are taking less vacations, right. And, and, and they want to make their vacations count. And so people will, in times of fear and uncertainty, people will tend towards brands because brands give a sense of security and certainty, right? I know what I'm going to get. Hey, look, Best Western's a you know, three, four star brand, right? We also have our Marriott property on the water. So if people are looking for a four and a half, five star property, you know, we have a Marriott property that, that hits those higher price points and four and a half, five star kind of property, right? And, but Best Western's a you know, three, three and a half, kind of maybe up to a four star kind of property. Well, you know what you're going to get. And if your budget is $150 a night to go and stay on vacation, you know, and a lot of people actually, you know, they, they can afford more, but they want to spend their money on tanks, air tanks, right? They want to spend their money on the third dive of the day or that night dive in the evening. So they're going to find a high quality uh, accommodations that gives them everything they want, all the standards, right? The, the room's going to be clean, the process for check-in, check-out. I mean, all of the things that we would come to expect when we go to a, a brand hotel, I'm going, I get that, but I'm only going to pay 150 bucks a night. I can take the rest of my money. I can buy more diving, more snorkeling, more fishing, more whatever, because that's what a lot of people want to do when they go to a country like Belize. So, the brand delivers processes, it delivers standardization, it gives real fundamental foundational to the operational elements of a hotel. That's really important. That, that, that it is, It's foundational. But then on top of that, what the brand brings is it brings heads on beds, right? To, to say it colloquially, heads on beds. The, the Best Western is the third largest is this right? The third largest in the U.S.? Help me. I know you have the stats on that. I, can't. I think it's the third largest in the U.S. and then the seventh largest in the world. In the world, right? So yes. It has a huge international presence as well. Right. So they've got an incredible reach. They've got an incredible marketing reach. Their relationship with the OTAs, online travel agencies, Expedia, Booking.com, right? Those are generally called OTAs. Their relationships with the OTAs and the travel agent world is deep, long, profound. And so what the, what the other side of the equation is, is they bring consumers, you know, people who want that nightly stay, heads on beds. They bring the heads on beds. But what we've done, and, and, and this is something that if you've known us for a long time, again, we've been in business. This is our 24th year of business. October, we will be entering our 25th year of business. And you know, and, and that's important too. Longevity in the marketplace says a lot. I mean, we've been through a crash in 1999 when the NASDAQ crashed. We went through the 2008, nine real estate bubble blowing up. And then, you know, obviously now as well, another big crisis. And so the longevity in the marketplace is really important. There are very few companies that have been around in Belize, for example, for 25 years. I can count them on two hands, probably, the number of developers that are still in business in, in 25 years. And so for the consumer, for the person who's going to own one of these units, that is really a, a, an important factor to take into, into mind, right? But then the branding, why the branding? The standards, uh, the, the, the operational level, the heads on beds. And, and when we do our performance, and we're very conservative, we actually use the Belize Tourist Board, BTB, Belize Tourist Board, we use their island average data for occupancy and, and average daily rate. The acronym is ADR, average daily rate. So we take their average occupancy and the average ADR on the island of Ambergris Key, and we run our performance based on that. And if you and 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 the folks that have worked with one of our sales consultants may have seen some of these documents. We take out everything. We take out the homeowners fees. We take out the uh, you know all the utilities, and and it's sort of a triple net number, right? Because at the end of the day, you know you can play around with those numbers, and you can say what's well, this, but then you've got to pay this, this, and this, and the homeowners fees, and or condo fees, or whatever, and blah blah blah. So so at the end of the day. It only matters how much money goes in your bank account at the, on, from an investment standpoint. You invest X, you receive back Y, right? And that number, we use a triple net formula. We use island averages for occupancy and ADR. And those kinds of returns are uh, a high single digit. And then after stabilization over a five-year period, because it takes a while for the hotel to get notoriety and, and stabilize, it's about a five-year ramp up, you know, then you're into double digits. And so, uh, then if you layer on top of that, what Best Western has done for hotels 
previously. Again, it's historical. Nobody knows the future, right? But if you look at what Best Western has done for hotels in the past in terms of the increase in occupancy and the increase to their average daily rate, and you look at those numbers and you run performance based on those, the numbers get even better. But we typically use the island averages as our baseline because we think that's a it's an average. It's, an, it's what's actually happening, right? It's not a theoretical thing. It's, it's, it's the average of what's actually happening right now. But the branding really only makes things better at many levels. So uh, long answer, but anyway, sorry, Rachel. I know you were- But it's a, it's a great answer, Mike, because we do have people on the line here who are both looking for residential and who are also looking for investment. So Grand Bayman, even though it's branded as a Best Western, you are able to live there full time yeah, full if time. that's what you choose, mm -hmm. or you're able to yeah. put it into the Best Western rental program if you're looking to accomplish that uh, that that nightly rental program. So sure. very very good. All right, so I'm seeing some great questions come in here now, and I'm going to just recite them to you, Mike, and you answer them to the best of, of your ability. If you need any help, I know you're you 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 have a great general overview, maybe with numbers. If you need some help, I'm happy to help you, you out there yeah. uh, with yeah. the latest. All right, so this is from Ali. She asks, with such an affordable price, what kind of standards are the buildings constructed to and held to? Really great question. That, that is, uh, you know, so we, we, we work, our, our company is today in four countries, Belize, Nicaragua, Costa Rica, and Panama. And, and there are certainly different requirements, different engineering needs, depending on where you are. In Belize, the natural disaster that we, we have to deal with are hurricanes. And, you know, I put that on the table. I'm not afraid to say that. There are hurricanes in Belize. They, they come through. I guess in the 25 years that I've been working in Belize, we've had one direct hit and two hurricanes pass by offshore and create a, a little bit of a tidal surge, right? But we had one direct hit in 25 years. So, I mean, not a horrible record, but it's real. It's the reality. It's the natural disaster that you must engineer and build to. So we actually build solid concrete fully reinforced, our pilings are tied into the bedrock. The bedrock on the island is anywhere between eight and 12 feet below uh, the ground level. So we go down to bedrock, we tie in, the buildings are solid concrete construction. Uh, the, the physical building itself is a fully category five, cat five rated structure. The windows we put in are category four. And this is all according to the Miami-Dade building code. We use everything out of the U.S. in terms of our engineering standards. Uh, and Belize has really adopted those. So it's a Belizean standard, but it's based basically lock, stock, and barrel copy-paste out of Miami-Dade for the, for the hurricane standards. Uh, so we can only say that our buildings are Category 4 rated because the, the weak point are the windows, which are Category 4, which is up to about 150, 160 mile an hour impact. So it's, it's, it's a significant protection. Uh, and, and we have offered this. If, if somebody wants to upgrade their unit to a category five, uh, they can upgrade the windows. I, I would just tell you that it's outrageously expensive. It runs up to about eight to $10,000 to go from category four to category five, because for whatever, I guess the physics, it's kind of exponential. If your wind speed impacts go up to 180 to 200, the strength of the window needs to be like 10 times stronger or something. I, I, don't, un I don't understand the physics of it, but it's an exponential curve. And so it's a lot more expensive to go to category five. Um, but the building itself, solid concrete, uh, it will, it'll be there kind of no matter what happens. Uh, and the windows set a category four. Fantastic. All right, next question I'm seeing here is, what is ECI's track record for finishing projects and how have you changed your strategy to get better? Oh, great question. You know, uh, at, at, uh, on Ambergus Key, Belize, uh, we have uh, built and delivered the first 54 condos in the gardens. Uh, and this is a, I, I like to think of our buildings in bays, but this is 12 units. Is that right? The, the fleet is an actual 12, 12 units. Some are two well, bedrooms. Exactly. Exactly. 12 in total. Mm -hmm. So 12 units. So, uh, so we expect to break ground on these 12. In fact, we've already ordered the pilings because it takes 30 days to cure. So we're already front running it. The pilings have been ordered. I think they've actually been cast uh, and they take 30 days to fully cure. They'll send them over to the island. But by the middle end of August, we'll be in the ground building this building. Uh, it'll be finished up next May if everything goes according to plan. Uh, we run a really tight, uh, uh, really a tight ship when it comes to construction. Uh, at our project at Grand Pacifica, literally we bought a cattle pasture in 2002. And in 2004, we started building everything 
the electrical systems, the water system, the sewer system, the telecommunication, all the roads, the sidewalks, the storm sewers. And by 2006, that was all done. Our first condo building was finished at the end of 2006. The first homes were coming online, end of six, seven. Uh, today, there are about 70 homes and, and uh, 22 condos finished. We, we built a golf course, we built clubhouse, restaurants. So we actually have a really good track record of delivery of the product. Uh, and and, and that, that says a lot. So thank you for asking that question. Uh, the thing that we've learned over the years to answer that part of it, which is, which is really an insightful question, um, is we've learned that w while there are great builders and, and great companies that do construction, one of the things that, that we as North Americans have really figured out how to do, maybe, I mean, you know, maybe the Japanese and the Germans, whatever, I mean, you kind of, you know, take that, but we have figured out how to manage construction so efficiently. And Rachel, I know your dad works for, uh, uh, for Turner, Turner Construction, and yep. he's a project manager, right? And he builds yep. hospitals. I think I saw him in New York one time yes, when I was there. Yes, he uh, hospital, hospital, right? hospital, yep. mm -hmm. He's building a hospital, right? And so when you build things like hospitals and nuclear power plants and airports, and I mean, like the management of that construction process has to be so precise because you've got 50,000 different things all going on at the same time, and they all have to click like in clockwork, right? So the U.S. developed world has figured out how to manage construction so well that, that the developing world really is still struggling with in many ways. So the answer to the question is, is what we figured out how to do is hire contractors, build, you know, hire a contractor, general contractor, subs, whatever the subs are, all that kind of stuff, right? But then we actually perform the active management of that build, right? It's something that a GC and the, a general contractor in the U.S. would do, but we step in and we actually fulfill that role because that's the piece that really trips up a lot of the projects in Central and South America. Um, it's, it's the management of the project. It's not the desire on the part of the, the contracting company. It's not their skills as builders. Their skills are phenomenal. Um, it, it's, it's not even supply chain usually very often. It really has to do specifically with the management of the project, and that's where we can bring our expertise to the table and really have it be a game changer on the delivery. And that's the key word, the delivery of the product to the consumer uh, and, and then have it meet a North American standard. I think that's the other game changer that we bring. It doesn't really have to do with the, the construction so much. It has to do with how we look at the product. You know, we, we, we look at the product and we say, you know what? In the U.S., there's an outlet every eight feet around the walls, right? If the wall is 10 feet long, you have two outlets, kind of one at each side, right? But in Latin America, you might have a whole living room with one outlet in it or two outlets and a whole giant living room. And that's just not what we expect. I mean, we're going to plug in TVs and computers and lamps and on and on and on, right? And so if we just simply do some little things like put in enough outlets, then if you, if you put in more outlets, you actually have to put in a panel box that will serve that much electricity in the house, right? So you're not blowing fuses. I mean, these things cascade a little bit, but when you start to think about it from a standardization process, the U.S. figured out all this stuff, you know, whatever, 50 years ago, right? And so you don't have to go invent this wheel. You just have to take these good ideas that are time-tested and, 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 you know, well-worn in the U.S. and bring them to a place where they're just not really thought of and, and implement them. And that's what we do. So when you combine the management of the project with the, the integration of U.S. standards and, and, and uh, familiarity, uh, you really get a, a great product for a very, very affordable price. Um, and and it, it really is. It's a wonderful convergence of factors. Fantastic. All right. Next question I'm seeing here is from Joe. And he asks, will owners at Grand Beeman have access to the Marriott Pier? Will they be able to book snorkel flash dive trips there? Yes, absolutely. Uh, the, uh, the, the dive facility at the, excuse me, the dive facility at the Marriott um, is a separate business unit. Uh, and so sure, and you, if you want to go eat at the Marriott, you can go, you know, have a nice, have a nice meal at the Marriott as well. So um, yeah, yeah, that, 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 that is going to be uh, a, a wonderful part of ownership at the Grand Bayman Gardens. Fantastic. Next question here is with travel restrictions, the way they are, how can I trust that my reservation is a confident one sight unseen? How? You mean a reservation for, for ownership? Is that? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Oh, okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, 
Well, that, that's a great question. I think the, uh, the couple answers. One, you can take a look at what we've already done, the, the 54 units. We have people there that can certainly walk around, take pictures, show them to you. You could maybe do a FaceTime, do it live, whatever. So I think you can, you can, you can do that kind of inspection. Um, you, you may want to request a copy of our business plan. Uh, take a look again. How, how long have we been in business? Do some, you know, do some reference checks, things like that, to make sure that you know we are who we say we are. I think that's wise and prudent. Whether you're buying from us or buying from anyone, it doesn't matter. I mean, that that's good due diligence, uh, checking out references and, and those types of things. Uh, the other thing that we've we've offered, and Rachel, you may have to help me with the details, um, but for folks who actually want to make a reservation. Uh, in our next building, which is the Galleon building, uh, it, it's nine ninety nine, so a thousand bucks. I mean, we're right. round for that thousand dollar, fully refundable, one hundred percent refundable. And we, I think, we're giving folks up through the end of this year, even into early next year, to come down. And if you come down and you don't like it, here's your nine hundred ninety nine dollars back, and we're going to give you a couple nights accommodation. Right, you're going to come down two nights on us. Right, now you're going to pay for your airfare and your meals. Um, but, but, you know, we'll comp you a couple nights to come down and, and, and do that. If you want your, uh, if you want your deposit back, it, it's all back to you. So um, it's probably the best anyone can do in this moment. Uh, again, we've got track record, we've got longevity, um, but we do want you to come down too. Uh, we just understand that you probably can't. It's tough. <laughs> it's a little tough. Um, but, but yeah, come, come down and visit. It's a fully refundable deposit and uh, yeah. And, and, yeah, we'd love to. We want. We want you to come down, Rachel. Do you have dates? I think you're actually. I mean, we let's. Do, stay on we the, have let's two go. discovery tour dates that we've scheduled. It's November 18th of the 20th. Uh, nope, the 20th of the 22nd. I think it is. <laughs> Let me just look at my calendar. I'm going to be sending people down on the wrong dates, but we have them pretty close. I know. Um, I, I'm pretty sure it's November 20th to the 22nd, and then we have it December 18th of the 20th. So middle of November, middle of December. Yes. Yep. Yeah. Okay. There, yes. Yes. Yeah. And, and, and I think you, you pushed them out. So that we, yeah. So mm -hmm. that we have enough time to kind of let these, you know, I mean, look, they, they say Belize is going to open August 15th, but now I'm kind of hearing rumors that, you know, they may push it back a little bit. They may, may not. I don't know. They've pushed it back once already. Other countries are doing that. Bahamas, I think did. So look, I, I, I mean, we're in a time of uncertainty for sure. Um, but I think you were wise to push your discovery tours out towards the end of this year. Um, and again, very flexible. If people sign right. up and then we cancel it, I mean, you know, okay, well, you know, move forward. Try again. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> do what we have to do. But I know with our yeah. fleet building, this was a, a question that a few folks had because there are a handful of people within the 12 reservations who have been down and visit us before or have met us in person before at a conference mic. So it builds that sort of confidence and trust that maybe somebody who just heard about us may not necessarily have yet. But uh, for those who haven't been down to Belize, who maybe we haven't had the chance to meet in person yet, uh, what we did for the fleet building was let them know that if when they come down, if the building is not necessarily what they were expecting, or if the Ambergris Key is not quite as beautiful as I saw in all the pictures, we will get that, that condo sold for them. Um, because I'm going to imagine that there is going to be a demand, especially as it is in construction phase and close to opening, I believe that there, there will be a demand for it. So we will most certainly help you get that reservation sold or get that, that specific condo sold. And I wasn't going to mention this until the end, but I will mention it at the end as well. So the fleet building, which we talked about, that's the 12 condos. We have 10 studios to two bedrooms. Uh, the two bedrooms are all sold out, but we did just get noticed today that one of the, the studio um, ladies who reserved a studio is actually going to move forward to the Galleon building for a one bedroom. So we do have a studio available. And for anybody who is contemplating uh, ownership. I see a few of you on here that I've spoken with who was looking at a studio at one point. Uh, we will we will offer you $1,500 off if you decide that you want to claim that, but just let us know over email. And then for anybody who is perhaps looking for uh, maybe a studio or perhaps you want something a little bit larger, a one bedroom or a two bedroom in the Galleon, like Mike said, we will, uh, you could do a first right of refusal. And I don't think you touched upon this yet, Mike, but I think this is very important to touch upon is, and we've done this very, um, this very same process with our tiny homes as a first right of refusal list, because we understand we don't have everything ready yet for the galleon, but we've had a tremendous amount of interest from people who like the pre-construction prices, who want to be getting the best unit that there is in the building. So what we do is we take re uh, fully refundable, as Mike mentioned, reservation deposits. It puts you in a list in order of whoever sends their deposit first. 
And then from there you have first rate of refusal where we have all the floor plans available. So the $999 will secure that spot for you. When we get all the information, you'll receive it. You'll, depending on what order you're in, the first person, then it'll go to the second person, then the third person. And from there you're able to choose uh, exactly what you want. But um, I don't really think you touched upon this and it's something that you've mentioned quite a bit with the Marriott condos uh, on the beach, but do you want to talk to us a little bit more about first right of refusal because not, a, not people don't always understand it or it just needs a little bit more clarification of why it's, it's so important. Yeah, that's, that, that is an important uh, point, Rachel. The, the, a lot of, I mean, in real estate, the old adage is location, location, location. Yeah. Right? We, we, that's the old, you know, the old shtick. Mm -hmm. um, but the reason, you know, the reason it's the adage and reason it's, you know, it's there is, and, and people say it all the time, is because it's largely true in most cases. And so imagine a condo building that's, you know, four, four stories tall and four, four units wide. So there's 16 units, right? Well, and, and you, you, maybe you can price the floors a little differently. And I think we do that. First floor is a price, second floor, you know, top floor is the most because it's the best views. But, but the four units across the top floor, or I think the Galleon building may even have five or six across the top. I mean, we do bay, five bays or six. But the point is, is that some of those units are going to have better views than others. Some of those units are actually going to be nicer units because of the location in the building. A corner unit, for example, right, that'll have a more sweeping view as opposed to a unit maybe at the other end that's, that's got a limited view on one side. Well, they're priced the same, right? They, they, you know, it's a $150,000 condo or whatever the price is, right? And so one's clearly better than the other from a view standpoint, and, and, and maybe it's, you know, and there's some personal things that come into it too. Maybe you want to be right over the pool. Maybe you want to be as far away from the pool as possible. Right. Um, maybe you want a ground floor unit because you want to be able to walk in and out, or maybe you want the top floor unit. So again, choice and location is very, very important. Uh, but, but, but just from a totally, you know, objective standpoint, all units priced the same aren't really the same. And so first look is actually maybe as important or in some cases more important than the absolute lowest pre-construction pricing, which by the way, folks will get. I mean, if people sign up for the uh, first right of refusal on the Galleon building, uh, it, it will be announced as a pre-construction price. It's the lowest price we ever offer. Um, you know, people can, can make their reservation deposit. I think those are what, $10,000 till we break ground or something. Um, but the, uh, but the point is, is that, that that first look and then on top of that, the pre-construction pricing, which is, is the, the least expensive pricing we ever have on a unit, um, is uh, you know, those two things in combination are pretty powerful. Yes, yes. And here's a great question from Natalie. And she says, what are the views like from the fleet versus the galleon and are there water views? Um, there are probably not any water views per se on the... Uh, oh no, they're four stories, aren't they? Yep. When you yeah. when you get to yeah. the higher floors, you yeah. will certainly okay. have views of, of the bay. Uh, we parallel the bay, so you do have those views from the higher floors. Third and fourth floor, because the building's to the west. So exactly. if you're in the if you're in the fleet and galleon building and you're looking west, you're going to be looking over top of a two-story building um, that would give you some a beautiful uh, sunset views across the Bay of Chetamal. Uh Yeah. First and second floor, you won't. Third right. floor, it'll be maybe iffy, but the fourth floor galleon will have beautiful views of the uh, of the bay and the and the and the sunsets to the mm -hmm. west. Yeah. And yeah. and what we're doing in both of the buildings, in case you're not able to get out of the third and fourth third and fourth floor, because I know they are uh, highly desired, is there is going to be a rooftop terrace for all of the owners and guests within those buildings. So if you're not necessarily, if you're on the first or the second floor, you're still able to access the rooftop, grab some wine and cheese from Wine Divine, watch the sunset go down, and it'll be a really, a really lovely location as well. Yeah. So yes, and the fleet building looks down the property line. Um, so it has a pretty much a direct view looking south. And then the galleon is, is catty corner a little bit. Uh, it's a little hard to describe, but what we'll do is send you over a map if you'd like that. Um, but it's about 90 degrees. Here's the fleet building and then the galleon is about 90 degrees. Um, yep. from, from that angle. All right, this is a good question from Chris and Al. I'm so glad you were able to make it. Chris and Al have visited us a, a few years ago. And I know, uh, Mike, you kind of touched upon this, but maybe just reiterate, will you continue to build to the upgraded hurricane standards that you have in the past for Grand Damon, even though it'll be branded as a Best Western? 
Absolutely. In fact, uh, I don't think Best Western would have given us the brand had we not been building to the hurricane standards. So uh, absolutely we will. And, uh, and, and, you know, and we keep track of that. I mean, as the standards change uh, and they do change, I mean, the, the engineering gets better, the studies, you know, prove out different things. Uh, we will continue to adapt to whatever the, the current standards are. Fantastic. Uh, this is another great question. I know we've talked about elevators before, but how many stories will this be for the Galleon uh, and are there interior slash exterior elevators? Uh, yeah, four stories, uh, both fleet and Galleon and an elevator to service all four floors. It, it's a exterior elevator located in a, in a breezeway. So it's covered, but it's, it's outside. Fantastic. And then how will ownership of a unit be able to help with getting residency, citizenship, and a passport? Hmm. Um, I don't think it qualifies. I mean, I think the residency... 250. Two, 250, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so if you bought two of them, um, you know... Sure. Then for, for this, well, not for quite for the studios, but it, dep it depends, Chris, on, on what it is uh, you purchase. Because if you decide that you want to own a two or three bedroom, um, then you're able to yeah. apply for the investor residency. Mm -hmm. And the investor residency is when you invest $250,000 or more into the country. And so if you decide that you wanted a three bedroom and let's say I'm gonna make up numbers as 349,000 and just made up numbers, nobody will me do that, then that, then that would qualify you, but it doesn't have to meet that $250,000 threshold. So it just depends entirely. I know we talked about two bedrooms. Um, so it just depends entirely on, on what it is that uh, you'd like. All right, so next question here, and that's a residency by the way, and it can lead to citizenship after five years, a little bit of a longer process, but there is that ability there. All right, next question I'm seeing is from David, and I might answer this one for Mike, but you may, you probably know the answer too. David said, information received yesterday showed potential short-term rentals at 52% and long-term at 75%. Is this based on current, is this current or based on potential ramp up as Mike mentioned? Okay, I think the 52 is the island average. Yes, exactly. Uh, and I think the best Western lift is what? six, seven points higher or something like 60%, that? 60%, 60% is what Best Western uh, expects it to be. And we were able to get our numbers from the Best Western in Belize City. So right. there's some reality there too, as well. And for the long-term rentals, David, a uh, long-term, and that's about standard for the island. You have a re long-term renter for usually nine to 12 months. Sometimes it's even longer than that. Um, it just depends on, on what that agreement looks like. Sometimes it's two years. We've had renters with us for five, six years since we've opened. So it just depends in, entirely on how long you want to have that long-term renter for. So, all right, fantastic. Another question from David is, what is your electricity watts? 110, 120, or 220? 110, uh, 56, 60, 60 cycle. U U.S., it's a U.S. standard. Yep, yeah, you don't have to worry about bringing any converters for your electronics. You're able just to plug those right into the walls there. Um, and this is a good question, David, and I think there may be a little bit of confusion, but he says, if I decide to live in one of these units, am I being charged the daily HOA rates? I can answer that. So, in fact, we have a great product, and probably many of you have seen it, the Consumer Resource Guide, where we talk about 15 questions that we should ask when we buy property overseas. And, and one of the questions deals with homeowner fees, or in this case, condo owner fees, right? Because these are condos. But anyway, same thing. But condo fees, homeowner fees. Uh, the question we should always ask is, are they high enough? I know everyone wants to pay less. I want to pay less. I own several condos. I want to pay less. Um, but the reality is, is it costs whatever it costs to maintain a building, and in this case, an elevator, and paint the building, and the grounds, and the security, and the, you know, and, and the cleaning, and just all of the things that goes into maintaining a building to you know, a nice standard, right? And now a Best Western standard. Um, and so the, the real question is, is you know, are the fees high enough? The second question is, is who has the money? Where does the money go? And so if the money is actually homeowner's money, well, then it's not the developer's money. And so it's your money. If you're paying into it as a homeowner or a condo owner, that's your money. And so the real key here is that the, uh, that the standards for maintenance are being met and that the homeowners association um, is, is, is doing that on behalf of the homeowners or, or condo owners. So the answer to your question is yes, if you live in your unit, you will be paying condo owner fees. Um, but they're the same condo fees that if you rent your unit, 
you would pay. Uh, all, all condo uh, fees are based on square footage, I believe, Rachel, right? So studios pay less than a one bedroom, one bedrooms pay less than a two bedroom. But at the end of the day, it's, a, it's just a mathematical formula based on the size of your condo and all condos, no matter whether they're rented or owner occupied or long-term leased, pay the same condo fee uh, based on those ratios of, of square footage. Right, exactly. And, and I know that we've had that question before, but condo owners, it doesn't matter, like Mike said, if you're renting it or not. Um, the owner is paying condo owner's fees, whether it's in the rental program or not, because we do want to keep the grounds looking beautiful and the buildings looking uh, and being very well maintained. All right, so this is a question that kind of correlates to the question that Dave just asked, but he talked about, she said, Ali said, can you talk a bit more about the grounds as far as landscaping and gardens plans? Yeah, you know, we, we call it the Bayman Gardens because the, uh, the property is about seven acres in total. We've got a club facility, tennis courts, giant swimming pool, uh, and the first uh, four buildings are there. Uh, ultimately, I think we're going to end up with about eight or nine buildings, but about 150 to 170 units. And, and the reason we don't really know is, you know, a two bedroom is actually three bays. It could be three studios or it could be a two bedroom, right? So, so we have a rough idea that we'll be at somewhere you know, between 150 and 170 total units when it's all said and done, if, if the current trends of one bedroom, two bedroom and studios continue. Uh, the center of the property is a beautiful uh, wooded area. And so uh, we, we, we've done some work on it, but we're still in the construction phase. So it's really hard to get in there and do the, what I would call the ultimate gardening of that space because we're still in a construction mode. Uh, but we're doing what I would call the prep work. We're thinning, we're trimming, uh, we're adding new plants, we're doing the things that take time. If you plant a tree today, it's, it's three, four years before it's got some maturity to it. And so we're doing those kinds of things to be ready so that in three or four years when the project is built out, these gardens have, have matured enough to really take on the character that that really makes it a beautiful garden community. And that was always the idea that the, that the center of this ring of buildings uh, would, would encapsulate a beautiful tropical uh, garden on Ambergus Key. And, and, and again, a lot of the big trees are already there. They're, they're you know, 50 year old trees and they're just absolutely beautiful. Uh, so yeah, we're taking care of those and we're, we're planting in around and we're doing some trimming and thinning uh, in the gardens, but yeah, it's very exciting. It is very exciting. And I know uh, Yako, one of our coworkers, uh, saw an owl there in the trees at the gardens. And so there's a lot of bird, yeah, <laughs> right outside of the condo. So if anybody likes birding and wants to see this picture, it's a phenomenal picture that, uh, that she captured. But right that right out of the condo there in the, in the trees, which I thought was, was pretty neat. That is neat. All right, this, and this segues uh, nicely into the question that you were just asking about, uh, but what amenities can we expect to see at Grand Bayman? So you talked a little bit about what we can expect to see in terms of landscaping and the center of the property, but yeah. what else can we expect to see in terms of amenities? Well, I, you know, the, uh, the pool is already there, the tennis courts are there, the club facilities, the workout room. Uh, I think we have water aerobics. Well, we used to, but pre-COVID, I think we'll pick it back up again. But we had a group of uh, folks that came in and did water aerobics several times a week. There's yoga being taught. Uh, there are several fitness trainers that work out of the club. So if you want personal training, uh, there's a bar and restaurant on site near the pool. So all of those things will continue. I don't really see us adding much in terms of uh, other amenities uh, that would be you know, I would say general amenities. The one thing that, that Rachel mentioned, which is truly delightful, are, 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 will be, are the uh, rooftops, right? And so you can go up there and you can have as many people or, or just yourself or just you and your spouse and enjoy a, a beautiful sunset on the roof. Those kinds of things are, are truly magical. And, 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 and this property is delivering that. So, uh, so I think we've covered, yeah, I don't think there'll be any new amenities uh, to, to the facilities, actually. It's pretty well. It's it pretty is. Well it is. I mean, it, out, that's right? one of the big, I think the big factors too in this property. I mean, I don't know if I mentioned this, but I pre, I own there personally. Um, that's where my, my home is. I'm going to be switching it over to the Best Western Rental Program in the next few months here um, to, to really capture that market. But what I found is a lot of people really enjoy the property and coming to the property because you have everything there on site. And you are so close to the grocery store and the hardware store and the golf cart rental and restaurants, but you're kind of in your own area, 
where you're out of your way from the tourists so you don't have the, the karaoke until two in the morning but right. you're also close enough to town and you're close enough to the conveniences of being able uh, to get back and forth quite easily and quite quickly so i think that that's that's pretty important to note as well especially if you are thinking about it from the lifestyle perspective um, this is a, a good question from Dave, and it's a little bit more generally general about Belize, but it is something that is extremely relevant to people who are considering uh, ownership of real estate, is banking in Belize. Banking in the U.S. is on shaking ground. How is the banking in Belize, and is it tied to U.S. banking at all? Well, two, two things. One, if you, uh, if, if you have a let's say you lived out, the, 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 question, the answer to the question is kind of two, twofold, right? If you live there, then you may want to have a local Belize dollar account, right? If you want to go shopping, you can go in and spend your Belize dollars. If you pay your electric bill, you can pay it in Belize dollars, your, you know, your phone bill, whatever. Um, and, and so a Belize dollar, local Belize dollar account is something that many residents choose to have. You don't have to, they'll accept US dollars. Uh, almost anywhere. And so uh, if you pay by a U.S. credit card, they just do the conversion. So it, you don't have to have a local Belize dollar account. The U.S. dollar accounts in what are truly, you know, offshore banks, right, or international banks, if you are transacting in U.S. dollars, that bank is part of the U.S., you know, Federal Reserve System via a correspondent bank. Uh, all U.S. dollars ultimately, you know, you know, secure and trade uh, back through the U.S. Federal Reserve uh, on a daily basis. And so uh, if, if you have an offshore bank account and you have Canadian dollars, well, then the Canadian, you know, federal bank or national bank or euros or, or Swiss francs or pounds or whatever. But ultimately, if you're in the local currency, you're only in the local currency. So you're not tied into anything else. Uh, if you're in the uh, U.S. dollar, Canadian pound, you know, euro, franc, whatever, then each of those countries, you know, central bank will be the ultimate repository of those funds via a correspondent bank in those countries. So uh, you're not going to escape that. If, if you're concerned about the U.S. banking system, uh, you're not going to escape that in Belize uh, really at, at all in, in, you know, and in, in certainly in the international case uh, and in the domestic, you know, case of, of having a local dollar account, I, I don't know that I would keep very much money in Belize dollars. They're not convertible back to U.S. dollars very easily. So anyway, uh, not a great answer to your question, but there probably isn't a great answer to your question, uh, how it was framed anyway. There, there are other answers. I think, look, crypto, I mean, crypto is, a, is an easy way to be outside all banking systems. The problem is, is that if you went to a store in San Pedro and said, hey, I want to pay with my cryptocurrency, uh, they'd look at you like you had six heads. So again, I, I, I don't think there's particularly a great answer to that question right now, Dave. Well, well, Dave, if you do have cryptocurrency, I know of two restaurants on the island that accept Bitcoin. So that, that, there you go. Crazy. You can use the crypto. <laughs> at least that we don't get the same food over and over, but it's an option. <laughs> Rachel, that's, that's phenomenal. Actually, I did not know that. Um, yes, so th yes. In fact, that's, a, that's, actually, that's actually a blog. Um, I don't know if Ivan's on here, but if somebody would make a note. Sure. <laughs> we'll, we'll get our team on it. It's a Red Chili's, it's a Chinese restaurant, and then I think the other is Rain. Um, okay. both, both are delicious. That's a, that's a beautiful blog. That, that's great information for people to know. Yeah, yeah. But but also, uh, let's se we'll segue away from food for a moment and okay. back to banking in Belize. And uh, talk to us a little bit about financing Grand Bayman properties. Uh, okay, let, let me give a full disclosure up front. So I actually helped start a mortgage company in Belize in 1994, early 1995, uh, Exotic Key Mortgage Corporation. It ultimately became Key International Bank in Belize. So I'm one of the founders of Key Bank. I'm on the board of directors. I'm on the management committee. So just understand that, that uh, you know, I, I, I try to keep a pretty, you know, good you know, wearing this hat or wearing this hat, right? But you've asked me to talk about financing. So I'm going to put my key bank hat on just for a minute. But let me also say that there are other banks that do financing in Belize and throughout the region. And if you uh, want to use a different bank, look for a different bank, uh, you know, by all means, please do. Because, you know, as, and when I'm wearing my ECI Grand Bayman hat, 
What we really care about is helping you to own one of these uh, studios or condos uh, because that's what you want to do. So from that perspective, any financing is fine. And, and, but with my key bank hat on, yes, uh, key bank will finance 50%, 50 percent, five zero, 50 percent of any of our Grand Bayman properties. Uh, but, but we also as a bank finance other properties too, because when I'm wearing my key bank hat, like I, I, I look at that and I say, well, we can finance other properties around Belize and other properties around the Caribbean and, and Latin America. And we do as a bank. Uh, but our loan to value ratios are 50%. Uh, so the client puts up half the money, we put up half the money. It's very, very conservative lending, keeps us out of trouble. Uh, and so uh, again, we've, we've been doing, we've been as a mortgage company since 1995 and as a bank since 2003. Uh, so uh, good, good longevity in, in both of those as well. Yes. And I do want to mention, I'm going to put my Grand Bayman hat on here. Is that, well, we do, uh, we have put together special financing packages specifically for the Grand Bayman Gardens at 80% financing, 80% financing. So um, if you're interested in that, do talk to us a little bit more about what those. And let me, let me weigh like. in real quick. Mm -hmm. That's because... Key Bank puts up 50% yep. of the money, the client puts in 20% of the money, and Grand Bayman is taking a second mortgage exactly. for the 30%. Yep. So, exactly. Right, right. so, so it, it's really kind of a three-way. The client's in for 20%, Grand Bayman holds 30%, and Key Bank is putting in their maximum, which is 50%. So, Exactly. And here's a good question from David R. Is local currency accounts reportable to the U.S. IRS? Um, you know what? I'm not an accountant. I'm not a lawyer. Let me tell you what I do with my Belize dollars account. Uh, my understanding of the of the U.S. law and reporting requirements under the uh, the, the uh, FATCA and the FBAR and the 8938 forms require me to report any and all bank accounts, financial accounts uh, that I hold outside the United States. Uh, there are some some kind of de minimis uh, numbers, but. Uh, but look them up. They're easy to find. FBAR TDF90 uh, form online. All the instructions are there. Um, my recommendation is if you have an offshore financial account of any kind, uh, report it. Um, the penalties for not reporting are horrendous, up to a $250,000 fine and five years in jail. So, uh, I mean, be smart. Report. I mean, uh, you know, I've reported bank accounts for, you know, 20 some years now. And, uh, you know, I, I, every year I just make a big long list of all the bank accounts that I have signatory control over. Um, please do it. Please be compliant with U.S. law if you're a U.S. citizen. Um, you're, you're smart to do that. Fantastic. Well, the only other comment I'm seeing here is from someone who says, I'm in Explorer Room 301. Will this end in time for me to have a glass of wine and watch the sunset from my deck? And for those of you who don't know who that is, that is our chief operating officer who seems to have had a long day today. <laughs> but you do have great views from that, that condo there. Very nice views, sunset and bay views there. All right, so uh, that is the end for what I'm seeing here from incoming questions. <laughs> Greg just says cheers to him. Greg is gonna be your neighbor actually, Patrick. So uh, maybe maybe Greg, if, uh, if Patrick's feeling generous, he'll save a glass or two for you for when you come down. <laughs> uh, Fantastic. Well, Rachel, thank, Rachel, thanks for uh, putting this together and I wanna thank everybody for joining us today. And if, if we didn't get to your question or if this, you know, spurs other questions, uh, shoot us an email, shoot your, uh, your, your sales consultant an email, and we'll, uh, we'll get back to you with something very specific to uh, what you want to know. But, uh, but th these are great, Rachel. Thank you again. This is, this is a wonderful idea you had. Of course. Well, thank you, everybody, for joining us. Greg, we're super excited to have you as part of the development as well. Um, we're really excited to get to see everybody in person at some point. And for those of you who are not yet owners with us, uh, there is still that one remaining studio that we mentioned a little bit. I think midway through the call, the owner just, uh, is going for a one bedroom instead of the studio um, in the galleon. So just shoot us an email if you'd like more information on that. And uh, we'll, we'll go from there. Have a, a great afternoon, great evening, everybody. And we'll be in touch. Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.